Okay, well, welcome, uh, Clement. I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you about the Noah Sphere and uh, Tehar de Chardin. Thank you. I'm so happy too, to, to, to exchange with you on this exciting topic. Uh, let's begin with your background. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your kind of academic trajectory, and then how you became involved with the Human Energy Project. Well, if we want to go into details, I actually did um, uh, an A-level in, in science. So I've been more inclined to, toward uh, science, sciences in general. And then I started the university in mathematics, and I realized it was really too abstract, too technical for me. And I stopped and I went to philosophy, a kind of radical uh, term. <clears throat> and um, I was very happy about this choice. And actually this um, interest for mathematics and science uh, stayed because after my um, bachelor in philosophy, I did uh, an additional bachelor and master in mathematical logic. And then again, I was confronted with this very formal science uh, and I kind of needed to breathe and I didn't see much opening into it. So I did um, an additional master in cognitive sciences, uh, still in Paris, <clears throat> which was very exciting because we could pick many courses from many disciplines. So it was truly interdisciplinary. And uh, it's at this moment that I, I did a, a thesis about uh, a comparison between the brain and the internet. Uh, so that's in uh, 2005. And, um, and uh, the most interesting paper that I could find on the topic uh, actually were by uh, Francis Heiligen, our colleague. And so I decided to, to go to meet him and to, uh, <clears throat> and to see, to explore whether I, I could do a PhD, uh, within his group, which, uh, I eventually did. And, um, and so I, I explored, um, big philosophical questions because cosmological, cosmological questions such as uh, where do we come from, where are we going, uh, what is good and what is bad, so ethics, but everything in a, in a cosmological uh, and evolutionary context. And, um, and the Human Energy Project, uh, so it was uh, at the end of uh, 2019 that um, that uh, I I started to work on um, on on the chapter of uh, um, of the formation of the noosphere by by Teilhard de Chardin. Um, so yes, so the, the the project is to update the the, the science and, and of um, of Teilhard de Chardin and the idea of the of the noosphere. Um, and um, yes, that's uh, that's how I arrived uh, here. Okay, great. Well, I want to begin with the question as to why anyone would care about Teilhard, why anyone should care about Teilhard and the concept of the Noah Sphere, using some of your own language from from the articles that I've uh, read. Some of the things you write are: uh, it gives hope toward a positive and meaningful globalization. You also write. By contrast, the Noosphere vision provides direction and hope for the future, hope to tackle global challenges, whether they are social, economical, ecological, technological, or climatic. Most importantly, the Noosphere is a holistic idea that forces us to think of these global challenges together as tightly interconnected. The vision of the Noosphere might thus be our best bet to tackle meaningfully the global challenges of today. And so I love the, that description, um, uh, Clement, because it, it basically focuses on the outcome of these concepts. And you contrast it to other sort of globalized concepts, such as, um, uh, such as uh, you know, globalization, which is kind of an economic concept, Gaia, which is kind of an environmental concept, and, and also technocratic visions of the future. So could you just elaborate on 
on that, what the what the noosphere adds to these other visions. Yes, maybe the, the most general remark we can make is that the the future scenario that gets the the most attention are, are the the doom scenarios, the negative scenarios, um, and be, yes, for for very simple reasons, it's because they are, they are scary, so we pay attention to them, um, and if you look, uh, there, there is actually little really vision for for the long term future of um, of humanity and uh, and planet earth um and, and so and uh yes importantly it's it's easy to play the nostradamus to to explain how things could fail there are millions of ways um uh, evolution could fail and and there are not many many ways to 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 survive just as um Yes, so the, the analogy I like to, to to tell is that if you go to your doctor and you explain him what you have, you don't want your doctor to explain you all the ways you could die. You want the ways to you want to know the ways to survive. <laughs> and so and so and of course it's much more difficult. And now, of course, it's more, much more difficult to to Im imagine to foresee uh, a way forward rather than to say, "Oh, we are all doomed for one reason or another." Um, um, so, and yes, um, th this many global challenges that, that we face uh, uh, give us often not not, not very much hope. Um, yeah, <clears throat> probably except uh, people like Teilhard de Chardin, who who, who took uh, a kind of um, deep breath and 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 saw the, the long evolutionary time scale and, and was able to to see a trend of of uh, where evolution might be going, without implying inevitability for it. Because as you said, there's many ways to die, only a few ways to thrive. Um, and so somehow some kind of vision that's hopeful without implying inevitability, that would be false, um, is, uh, part of the, part of the, um, uh, vision. Yes. And I think, uh, you point to really, uh, an important question here. It's, um, so Taylor as a, as a kind of developmental view. He uses uh, the term uh, cosmic embryogenesis in uh, the phenomenon of man. And so, yes, there is always this tension. I mean, the two extremes are uh, evolution is completely random and no evolution is completely deterministic and inevitable in, in some direction. Um, and, and yes, uh, of course, the truth is somewhere in between, but knowing what are the, the, the things that are really um, necessary almost for all living creatures to, to have, such as, um, yes, the, the, the invention of the, uh, of the eye, <clears throat> which appeared many times, and because it gives so much information about the environment to be able to capture light. Mm. So you could argue that this it's a kind of inevitable outcome. If we see, if we find aliens, we wouldn't be surprised that they have some, uh, some kind of eyes, um, which might work differently from the biology or the technology we know, but they, they would capture electromagnetic radiation one way or another. Mm. Um, so yes, and on this question, I think the the, the thought experiment of uh, Stephen Jay Gould is is very interesting. He asks, "What would remain the same if we would replace the tape of life?" Um, and some uh, some would say we would have some things that are totally different uh, or, or very similar things and uh, yes it, it's a it's a big challenge to, to try to to see what are 
will is uh, the, the important landmark or uh, kind of inevitable outcomes, even if they are quite abstract, like uh, a kind of eye. Well, one of the things you write, uh, Clement, in what you've written on the um, uh, Human Energy Project website, is you say the noosphere is a sphere of thought enveloping the Earth. And in that statement, there's actually two statements. One is a sphere of thought, and the other is the scale of enveloping the Earth. And I wanted to separate that and ask the question, what is a sphere of thought? How can a sphere of thought be defined at any scale? Uh, not just the scale of the whole Earth, but at any scale. How would you define a sphere of thought before we get to the scale of its application? Yes, well, in this definition, I really take the, the etymological meaning of it. Um, and, and yes, it's, it's a quite abstract thing, but um, I, I would say it, it goes, um, yes, it goes with um, the tradition of, um, of, of the sphere, language, or, or, or discourse that has been around since um, thousands of years. So it, it builds on that. Um, and, but personally, I'm, um, I mean, that's, that's a metaphor for what is coming that attracts me the least because it's a, it's a geometrical metaphor, the sphere. And so uh, a sphere is a, is a very simple thing in mathematically in one little equation, it's defined. And, and so I, um, yes, I, I think if we need to, if we want to define it further, we need to, to add some hypotheses, some models to, to, to go further. Let me, uh, uh, provide some of my own thoughts. I think a sphere, of course, implies a boundary. So uh, a sphere has a boundary. Thought implies, of course, something mental. And I would like to, I would like to nominate an organism as a sphere of thought. Uh, um, and of course, in the noosphere, the concept of an organism and a superorganism, the whole earth is a superorganism looms very large. Uh, the first thing you said in response to my question was that there's something teleological about it. And so I think that that um, an organism, of course, it has a it has a boundary, and within that boundary, it is highly cooperative, highly regulated. Uh, there's something mental in all creatures, even bacteria have mental processes. And of course, by the time we get to organisms with nervous systems, and they clearly have mental processes. So is it is it um, um, would it be right to, to call an organism a sphere of thought? And therefore, I mean, we're working towards the idea of a planetary superorganism. And so I think it's actually quite important to 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 be able to conclude that an organism qualifies as a sphere of thought at a very uh, small scale. And then what we need to do is to expand that sphere. So what, uh, how, how do you think about the, all of that? Well, I, I wouldn't go as far as you as to say that a bacterium has, has a, is a sphere of of uh, thought or as thought, I would, my, I would start, uh, I mean, maybe with, uh, the appearance of nervous systems and, and maybe even, uh, of uh, associations of the capacity of associations. Um, but yeah, that, that's just, a, a question of definition, <clears throat> although in Taylor's worldview, everything, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, everything has some degree of consciousness that is law of complexity consciousness. So even the inanimate world has, has a tiny bit of, of, of consciousness. Um, so he, he holds a kind of uh, pan psychist view and that's actually his key to, to have, uh, one consistent story for, for cosmic evolution. Is that he 
he doesn't need the, the dichotomy between matter and life that uh, that Bergson had, because the whole universe is uh, um, consciousness and complexity increasing in uh, in various forms. Yeah, and um, and you say that that's you say that that's become a kind of a, that panpsychic view has become quite marginal. Um, um, in modern terms, and and not everything Teilhard said we need to validate. I mean, I mean nobody's clairvoyant, and so when we evaluate Teilhard and the concept of the noosphere, I think it's remarkable how much he did get right. But that doesn't mean that uh, that he got um, uh, that he got everything right. And and one of the points I wanted to make, Clement, which which comes through when you're writing, is that the concept of evolution, of course, preceded Darwin. Uh, the word is most closely related to the word development. And the evolutionary perspectives before Darwin, well, they frankly, they didn't, you know, they weren't very productive. And, and what made Darwin's theory so significant compared to the other concepts of evolution during his day was that specific mechanism of variation, selection, and replication. That's what made it so distinctive and and remains distinctive today. So if we want to talk about something like cosmic evolution, we need to be clear, as you do, that this is not Darwinian evolution. We're not saying that the universe evolved by a Darwinian process. Uh, when we look at inanimate nature, uh, we're not saying that it's teleological and functionally organized in the same way as animate nature. So distinguishing broad generic concepts of evolution with the specific concept of Darwinian evolution, in other words, defined as any process that includes the three ingredients of variation, selection, and replication, is uh, for me an important distinction. And I'd just love you to comment on on that Darwinian evolution, which I, by which I don't mean genetic evolution. We're going to get to that. Darwinian, Darwinian evolution goes beyond genetic evolution. And one of Teilhard's great insights was to actually understand the importance of cultural evolution uh, way before his um, way before his his time. But the distinction between variation, selection, replication processes, let's call that Darwinian as opposed to more general concepts of evolution. Could you comment on that? My colleague, um, Joseph Campbell, who he calls himself a, a universal Darwinist, he, he would, um, would argue that, um, that some kind of variation and selection happens also outside of, uh, of living things. And he formalizes this with uh, Bayesian reasoning and so on. And, 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 uh, and I think the most general thing is that it's a kind of learning process where some things stays, stay and other things can, can build on, on top of, of this. Um, but um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that uh, there are there are people working on, on making this uh, um, this continuity of of, of evolution, uh, uh, but I, I do I do largely agree with you that um, that it's a, it's a clearly different process that's happening since uh, the, the origin of life, um, and. And also, yes, the, 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 the metaphor, when, when we speak about cosmic evolution uh, in the cosmological sense, uh, actually, we, we mean more uh, a development because there is just one universe by, by definition. Um, and, and so you, we don't have a, a variation of universes and a, and a selection mechanism to, to select the, the, the fittest universes. So what's really happening? It's a uh, it's a kind of uh, development uh, where new structures appear, galaxies, stars, planets, uh, life, intelligent life. 
Yeah. And uh, so, for example, you know, we like to say nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, but nobody ever says nothing about the weather makes sense except in the light of evolution. The weather is a physical system. You know, we can understand it in physical terms, but we don't, we're not teleological about it and we shouldn't be. So, so um, I think that uh, that distinction between uh, uh, living processes and inanimate non-living processes, uh, we don't have to get too philosophical about it. Just compare the weather to any life form and we're there. I mean, I think that there's, there's something about life forms that calls for a different mode of analysis than, than, um, than a, a purely physical process such as a weather. I make the same point by comparing, for example, a snowflake with a single organism like a fruit fly. I mean, a, a snowflake is very complicated structurally, but the only way to analyze it is in physical terms. It's a, it's a process of ice crystallization, and that's the end of the story. But with a fruit fly or any kind of organism, that's a bit different. I mean, the fruit fly is adapted to survive and reproduce in its environment. It's a functionally organized unit, and that demands a certain kind of analysis, or you might say permits a certain kind of analysis in which everything under the fruit fly its organs, its cells, its molecules, we understand in terms of its contribution to the functioning of the whole. So that's, so that's functional analysis. I suppose you could call that teleological. At the very least, it's functional, which is what's so special about an organism, basically, and what we'd like the whole Earth to become, although it's, it's by no means is at this at this moment. So am I on the right track? Are we, are we kind of um, on, uh, uh, on the same wavelength with, with respect to that? Yes, yes, the, definitely. I mean, that's, that's also the, the, the nature of cosmic evolution broadly construed is that at the beginning there were not even atoms and atoms formed which enable chemistry and then chemistry enables uh, uh, organic chemistry and, and first life form. So each time there are new emergencies, uh, new things that are um, that are possible thanks to yes, this uh, complexification. And, and so yes, it, it's, it's, so it just makes the point that the particular transition from non-life to, to life, yes, is, funda is something fundamentally new that, that arises on, in the universe with a new dynamic, with new rules, with a, uh, yeah. And I think that one of the, uh, one of the stark insights that uh, follows from uh, Darwin's theory, which it took him a while to uh, appreciate, was the fact that that um, natural selection operating at the individual level tends to result in social disruption, not social cooperation. That if it's really a matter of, of which individuals survive and reproduce better than other individuals, then that selects for what we call selfishness. And that uh, in order for cooperation to take place, for individuals to evolve to benefit other individuals, there has to, has to be some process of competition at a larger scale. There has to be some sense in which cooperative groups survive and reproduce better than non-cooperative groups, because within those groups, the non-cooperator has an advantage over the Oh, the cooperator. And my, co my colleague, the philosopher Elliot Sober, has actually taken the trouble to go through all of the editions of Darwin's books, all six editions of Origin, for example, and to and to show how this this awareness was gradually dawned upon Darwin that his theory could could in its in its just individualistic form could not explain everything we call prosocial, and that he needed to add something which was this kind of multi-level concept that there had to be selection at the level of he put it community. The community uh, a selection, and so co cooperation enters and, and a very very fun. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, he he uh, 
Uh, you might even say that his thoughts on what we now call group selection or multi-level selection was forced upon him when he when he realized that he could not explain everything associated with virtue, bravery. And then he famously said, you know, although it is not the case that the moral individual survives better than other members of his own tribe, but it is true that the moral tribe outcompetes other tribes and this would be natural selection. And so, uh, and he elaborated upon that um, uh, progressively as he, as he developed his own, his own, um, his own thoughts. So, so not only does this basically uh, highlight the importance of cooperation, which we'll get to with major evolutionary transitions, but also the fact that in nature, there's often non-cooperative outcomes. I mean, there's, there's so much suffering and strife in nature. And so, for example, I, I would put it to you, uh, an organism, of course, is by definition a highly cooperative unit. What about a disease-ridden organism? What about an organism with cancer? Is that a sphere of thought or is that a disruption of a sphere of thought? If we have two, a predator and a prey, for example, that are locked in a co-evolutionary race, is that a single sphere of thought or is that two spheres of thought that are at odds with each other? And the more we base the concept of a sphere of thought or as an organism on cooperation, then what do we do with the non-cooperative aspects of nature or human nature? What would we do with, for example, a despotic political regime or a, or a failed state or a, or a slaveholding society? These are, these are societies that we don't want for ourselves. It's certainly not what we're working towards with respect to a planetary noosphere. But how do we, how do we categorize so the absence of cooperation and the presence of strife and, and uh, uh, in either, either the biological world or the human world. Because um, the, the tension here is between competition and cooperation and, and both have advantages. Um, there is no competition anymore. Um, there, are, there can be many, many drawbacks and or stagnation. Um, so, <clears throat> but yes, um, in the case of, of natural ecosystems, uh, like the predator prey dynamics, um, unless there is a kind of external manager that that regulates this it's uh i don't see how, how it could uh, disappear oh, also because yeah i mean uh, animals eat other animals so i mean some have to die um and um, so yeah for, for me the the core question in, in this discussion is how much competition and cooperation do, do we need to to sustain so that the, the system as a whole uh, remains adaptive and, and evolves and continue to evolve. Uh, so now I was just going to, to give the example of uh, if of major telecom companies who who cooperate to 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 have high prices on, on communications uh, then it's uh, there, there are laws, uh, antitrust laws uh, against these kind of practices, so so that there is a healthy competition and that uh, new actors can can come in and and that uh, and that uh, the users can uh, can benefit from uh, a fair system. So we we need competition. Absolutely, we need competition. I mean, basically, any cultural change, whether benign or not benign is a form of competition. When one thing replaces another, that is a, a form of competition. So if we want positive cultural evolution, yeah, it's gonna be, uh, let it be as fast as possible. So therefore let it be as competitive as possible. But it's that target of selection that is all important. So in the case that you were talking about with telecom companies becoming monopolistic, that's a form of competition, which does not lead to a benign outcome. And it needs to be, 
it needs to be regulated, basically. Um, competition needs to be regulated for the common good is what we're saying, I think, in plain, in plain language. And if it's not, then we're going to get, we're going to get some outcome we don't want. I don't, doesn't matter what we call it. It's not something we, we, uh, uh, we want. So, so basically it needs to be a cooperative outcome and that requires regulation. So kind of information and cooperation become joined at the hip or needs to. Um, and uh, so uh, why don't you speak on that and bring in the concept of major transitions as you understand it? Because I was so happy reading your work, Lamont, that you, you highlighted the, the concept of major revolutionary transitions, which goes all the way back to the origin of life. And that you saw the emergence of the planetary noosphere as, as, as basically projecting the concept of, of major revolutionary transitions into the future. Yes, no, I think this is uh, really the key concept to to understand the, the future of globalization and of, of uh, planet Earth. Um, uh, and yes, in a way, it's um, it's an amazing thing to, to be alive today in the midst of this uh, evol major evolutionary transitions, because if you look at the history of life, there were very few of them. So we are somehow very privileged to to live it even though it's uh, very complicated and difficult in many respects um so yes um, major evolutionary transition is when um when a new new um, new mechanisms of evolution emerge with new often yes with, with new information processing uh, capabilities and a, a new level of control that can that can uh, uh, make different uh, units different uh, sets co cooperate and, and and function at a, at a, at a new new level and yes I think we we are, yes we are seeing this uh, new information medium it's uh, it's pretty clear that it's uh, it's the internet that connects us all in a in a very different way than we were connected a, a few centuries ago um and then the the, the, the rest is work in progress basically how how how, how how the nation states and the, the, the different actors will coordinate to to um, to take care to to manage uh, not only the, the humanity but I would also add uh, the biosphere at large and and the geosphere so the, the climate uh, the pollution the, the oceans etc. So I think I think it's uh, it's important if we. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so it's important if we really want to to um, to think about to speak about a planetary ma major evolutionary transition that it's not just humanity we're talking about. It's it's uh, the whole Earth, so the the geosphere, the biosphere, and the noosphere, so something that is emerging now. Yeah, I mean that we agree on the need for basically to become for humans to become stewards of the rest of life on earth and not to have some outcome that's that's just human that would be a, a dystopia for many of us including myself and and um and yourself how, how strongly that can be justified um on scientific grounds i think it can because i mean it's our life support system but there's also i think a almost a philosophical obligation to to regard uh, in some sense the earth is sacred and i'm going to come back to this um, how much we need the concept of sacred in developing these uh, ideas, not without necessarily bringing in anything supernatural. The concept of the sacred is um, need not invoke anything supernatural. When something is sacred, you place it above yourself. You honor it. You uh, you um, you're happy to be part of something larger than yourself when you regard that thing as as sacred. And for us to regard life as sacred, life on Earth is 
as sacred, I think, and puts us in that stewardship uh, uh, position. So I think that, but I wanted to review my understanding of major evolutionary transitions, um, uh, Clement, because, uh, because seeing human evolution, human genetic evolution as a major evolutionary transition, I think is important because what it does is it, and, and it really, I think, affirms some of Teilhard's key insights because in the first place he said that that um, in some ways we're just another ape species, but in other ways we're a new evolutionary process and therefore uh, as significant in our own way as the origin of life is how I put it. That process was cultural evolution. And when you ask the question, how is it that we became so much more cultural, bearing in mind that many other species have cultural traditions, so culture is not uniquely human, but the degree of culture is. And the reason is, I think, what we can say from a modern scientific perspective is because our degree of culture requires an exceptional amount of cooperation. You can't really have a fully blown cultural evolutionary system without a high degree of trust among members of the cooperative society. And that's what's lacking in our ape ancestors. When you look at our closest relatives, for example, the chimpanzees and even bonobos, what you find within a single community is a little bit of cooperation and a lot of disruptive competition. Those societies are despotic and in, in human terms. And so the, 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 the human, the, the first human major evolutionary transition began with an increase in cooperativity caused largely by mechanisms of social control. To put it simply, you couldn't just bully people in ancestral human societies because those other people had the collective wherewithal to, to collectively suppress bullying is, is the way to put it. And then once we became highly cooperative in all respects, physical plus mental, then this particular form of human mentality evolved. It was cooperative human mentality that enabled such things as consciousness and symbolic thought and, and so on. So including, of course, spoken language, but, but more generally, the capacity for symbolic thought. And it had to be egalitarian. So this is what's so interesting. Is that um, is the idea that that the essence of what it means to be human is to live in egalitarian groups that are cooperative and trusting enough so that they can communicate with each other. That is like so. Okay, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> uh, no, about the egalitarian parts. <clears throat> yes, it, it's a um, it's a fundamental uh, way in which we we work in groups. But there is also, uh, in a, what, what uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, uh, or the, the ones who study the evolution of morality have found is that we are also looking for good leaders. And what is a leader is someone who is above others, who is uh, uh, higher in the, in the hierarchy. So there is really this tension between we want equality, but we want also good leaders. And, and this is interestingly incompatible. And, and yes, I think it's, um, everybody likes to have a good boss that, that takes a good decision, that is a, a leading person that drives things in the right direction. But if we would vote for every decision he has to make it, it, in a negative way, it, it wouldn't work. Um, so really, there is this very interesting tension, and I, I, I don't know exactly, yes, what, what to make of it, and when can we call a leader a good leader, and when do we need to, to, to go to trust more egalitarian uh, processes and so on? Well, right, uh, uh, Clement, and, and uh, you know the work well of um, uh, Joe Henrik and, um, and um, Francisco Gil White on, that makes a distinction between dominance and reputation. So basically, um, a leader, one way to become, to achieve high status is by the exercise of raw power, we call that dominance. 
The other is to cultivate a good reputation, and the, which of course means doing things that are good for the group, coordinating activities for the for the good of the group. And so, and so, leading, achieving status by reputation is what enables there to be leaders, because structurally there does need to be leadership, but leadership that's accountable to everyone. That's what keeps it egalitarian. And so that distinction between basically being able to hold leaders in check, granted that we need them, as opposed to having them go out of control. Well, of course, it's a tension that's existed throughout human history and, and exists to this day. So that tension will never go away. Um, it's, it's, it comes back to, to you know, achieving by a lower level competitive process versus a higher level competitive process. But the point I want to make is that not yes. only was there a, a major... Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Derek. Go on. No, no. Uh, just a, a, a thought that um, maybe what's lacking with a reputation gain leader is is some kind of, of force or control mechanism to, to punish the non-cooperator, the bullies, etc. And and so if you have my point is that if you have only trust from the others, it's not enough to to manage the the group. You need also some some mechanism to inhibit or to stop um, the the, the non cooperators, and so some kind of uh, dominance by by some kind of force, let's say. So I think yeah, a good leader a leader needs both. Yes. And the whole nature of morality um, is to have two dimensions. There's a compulsory dimension. We have norms. We, we expect each other to behave. And if we don't, there's, there's real punishment, basically. There's your, there's your exercise of, of power. Um, and then there's a voluntary dimension. We want to help people for its own sake, motivated by sympathy, love, and, and so on. And the idea that the compulsory dimension of morality creates the safe environment to exercise the voluntary dimension of morality is uh, uh, something that I really love that combination, basically, which makes sense of why morality does have two dimensions and why the compulsory dimension is required. Because if it didn't exist, it would be too dangerous to be uh, pro-social, too dangerous to be altruistic without that compulsory uh, dimension. But what people like Peter Turchin uh, have shown is that what we know historically is the increasing scale of society should be thought of as actually a series of major evolutionary, uh, cultural evolutionary uh, transition, building in those those mechanisms. So to focus too much on the internet, I think is is not quite right because if you look at things like, first of all, spoken language, um, written language, uh, you know, physical infrastructure like roadways and bureaucracies and and uh, and meaning systems. You know, the axial age. Um, I've had interviews with um, scholars on um, the emergence of democracy in ancient Greece, and so all the institutions that supported that. Not to speak of the the um, uh, philosophers. All of these can be seen as, as basically not gradual. Uh, it's it's actually more back and forth than gradual, but um, uh, with a net increase in the scale of cooperative society leading up to the basically the modern nation state and a degree, a small degree of international cooperation. I think it's quite useful to think of that as not just one human major transition, but a whole series of them, which makes the final transition to global governance a little bit more workable, basically. Um, it's really, in some ways, a final step, as opposed to, as opposed to some new, some new thing. What do you think about that? Yes, I absolutely agree that, uh, in a, in a way we should see our, our nation states as, as really precious, uh, kind of ordering organizations, despite all their flaws. Um, and um and yes it's um 
I mean, it's a, it's a, it's for me. It's clearly the the next step, uh, the, the the core thing actually about the the noosphere and speaking about something planetary. It, it, it's first and foremost an international uh, problem. It's how, how how can these biggest human cooperative structures, which are nation states, how can they further uh, connect and collaborate and coordinate to, to solve the, the global challenges. And they have to, because the challenges are, are global and that we, we are realizing it um, more and more. And, and so the, the, somehow the, the, the interests of the nation states uh, coincide more and more with the interests of, of planet Earth and that, that will force the nation state to, to, to collaborate and co cooperate uh, for, for hopefully a, a greater good. And so I think that when we follow that through, we, in the first place, if, if we think of what a, a global moral system would look like, uh, that's, that's a final rung basically of this multi-level ladder. Well, the global good, of course, must be, must be the highest virtue. What we do must be good for the whole earth. And there has to be a compulsory dimension to it. If you don't do that, then there has to be something to done about it. There has to be a compulsory dimension. So there has to be some kind of regulatory apparatus. And that's, of course, not easy. But um, there has to be such things as transparency. Um, uh, uh, status needs to be, status of a nation needs to be earned by reputation. And these are all mechanisms that they're needed at all scales. They exist at smaller scales to a degree. They're violated at all scales too, by the way. Um, I think one point I think needs to be made is that this is not global. In order to have global governance, there needs to be multi-level governance. We can't just directly behave with the whole earth in mind. There has to be all manner of intermediate institutions um, and meaning system all the way down to small groups in order for this superorganism to to work. And each one of those has to work well as a subunit. So, I mean, th this is part of, I think, what the superorganism metaphor is. If we really want to get serious about a, anatomy and physiology um, and nervous system for a global superorganism, we need to be talking about cells and organ systems and and all of that has to exist, the counterparts for them, right? Right, right, right. Um, although, yes, I don't know, there is also a kind of dilemma in the, in the with a question of, of scales. Do we really need to to fix 100% uh, transparency uh, reputation at, at all levels before we can start to have to have uh, transparency and reputation between nation states? Or, or could we start to have uh, something that, that works even if all the lower levels are, are not perfectly cooperative organizations? My intuitive feeling is that maybe we need uh, at least, I don't know, 80% uh, or 19% of, uh, of cooperative uh, well-managed action or, or on the levels that there is a, a tolerance of of still that the, the systems at the lower level would malfunction from time to time and and still the, the higher level could 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 burst forth could, could appear but i i don't know what's your feeling about this well i think that it does need to be incremental and there is uh, a, a um, many lessons from lower scales that can be applied to higher scales. We know from game theory, for example, that if you have a, a groups with some threshold frequency of cooperators, like 20% cooperators or 30% cooperators, and if they're able to basically confine their interactions with each other and then to impose sanctions on others and so on, that you could actually get the evolution of cooperation from that starting point. So you don't have to start with everybody cooperating. That's not uh, that's not uh, required, and and very often it's the case that the governance can be first sort of a bottom up form of governance and then followed by formal governance. There's uh, so much regulation takes place 
um, uh, in an un informal fashion. Norm changes, for example, who orchestrated who orchestrated um, uh, the Me Too movement? How did how, how did norm changes about sexual bullying come about? That's an amazing when you when you think of it. Sometimes there's a shift in what people regard as right and just, and just the consequences of that. They drive laws; they're not preceded by them. And so I think that there's a sense in which that kind of thing can. Uh, can uh, take place, and that's a good thing because I don't think you know formal governance is going to be a following force. It's not going to be a leading force for the uh, for the um, uh, for the most part. Yes, yes, no. That these are great examples, of course, and and that are made possible thanks to the the acceleration of information and the fact that we are so tightly connected and. Uh, and so one of, one of the main results of this is that we have uh, developed, humanity has developed a, an extremely high intolerance for, for any kind of violence because any kind of violence can be reported very easily with a smartphone anywhere on planet Earth. And so it means that the world will know about it and, and, and be outraged about it. And, and then suddenly millions or billions of people will, would react and then yes, nation states and yeah, we need to leave something as you say more formally top down to, to, to try to, to solve these issues. Yeah, I mean it's so interesting to compare, for example, the surveillance state, the idea that that, uh, that everything we do is being watched. We we fear that about authoritarian societies, Chinese society or Soviet societies uh that's what you know uh 1984 was all about and yet at the same time if we kind of like the idea of having every policeman have a camera on their chest to record everything that they do and then including their misbehaviors and so it's it's, it's this kind of transparency has both a benign face and a and a sinister Faith, which all depends on the back to the degree of social control. That if we live in an egalitarian society, then that kind of transparency is good. But if we live in a totalitarian society, then that kind of transparency is bad. So uh, it really boils down to the the um, establishment of egalitarian principles. And I think that that comes down to what Tehard talked about. Um, with respect to maintaining individual freedom. I think that he was aware of this and was aware, of course, living in World War II, as he did, between World Wars, um, as he did. And uh, and uh, uh, so obviously this vision that we're reaching for is not the vision of a fascist or a totalitarian society. And there's some sense in which the individual remains, as I, as I think he put it, that pearl beyond price was the individual the worth of the individual. But still, I mean, that's an argument from uh, my colleague uh, Dirk Helbing. Mm, the, the notion of uh, privacy can be seen as something very important at a systemic level. Uh, like even our, our bodies are composed of cells which have boundaries. And, and those boundaries uh, <clears throat> They, they allow a lot of adaptability and uh, easy replacement, re repairing, etc. And and when we violate privacy, it's, uh, he says it's as if you you would explode all the walls of all the cells in, in your in your body. You would die immediately. So that that's I mean that's an argument I was uh, I was sensitive to. We need privacy just for a systemic reason like this. It makes it benign. And from the very beginning, this, this kind of fiercely protected egalitarianism has both an individual pole and a group pole. So basically, bullying is the, is the great problem. So basically, you can't tell me what to do. You can't bully me. So there's that. But then there's also, and we're going to do this. <laughs> and so it's like, it's individualistic and communal, communal at the same time. And, and that needs to be scale independent. That needs to be true today. 
that we have this sense of individual freedom that I can do what I I want to do as long as it's not harmful up to scale. And in fact, I need to do it because we need to make decisions together and so on. Part of being part of the group superorganism is being part of the group brain and and taking part of in decision making processes and so on. So I think what's what's really uplifting about about uh, Teilhard's vision, or at least the modern version of it that we're trying to construct, is that uh, it is so equitable and, and egalitarian at the same time as it's communal at the global uh, uh, scale. It's like it's like being able to retain all our values. There's no there's no steep trade-offs between between those those communal values and those individual values in my in my opinion yes although yes i i ask myself um if if those um if those uh, prefer moral preferences of uh, egalitarianism um uh, or, or others that, that evolved through through time uh with the evolution of humans in, in small groups, uh, would they necessarily be always fit in in bigger groups of uh, of uh, like cities or or indeed the, the whole planet Earth? Um, <clears throat> it might be more complicated than that, and our, our biology or our biological inheritance, inheritance uh, heritage, sorry, might um, might bias or, or slow us down somehow, and maybe we need to to find new kinds of values that, that um, and to learn new kinds of values that that fit more with, a, with this global superorganism that is arising. Yeah, well, I think I had a whole conversation on that with uh, Shima Beji, uh, your colleague there over there at. Uh, Working with Francis, uh, and um, and I think cities are a wonderful focus, a wonderful focus because they're that intermediate focus I was talking about. That there should be some uh, um, uh, uh, sphere of thought, which is which is let's make the city the sphere of thought, as opposed to the whole earth. Let's make a smart city, and the smart city movement is all about that. And I think that her whole message with her uh, um, Smart Cities, uh, Mindful Smart Cities Manifesto is that in the first place, we don't want those technocratic versions of smart cities. That's like your technocratic future that uh, is not exactly what we want at the planetary at the planetary scale. We need a some kind of compassionate city that, that's compassionate for its members, and it needs to be consultative. Um, if you really want a smart city, well, ask people, ask the, ask the residents of the city what's what's going to work for them. And and first and foremost, research shows us they care mostly about their neighborhoods. That's their primary concern. So let's make the neighborhoods good first. Those are the cells and so on and so forth. So I think that, that when we focus on the city as something which is a lot more manageable than the whole earth, uh, but still it's the same problems. It's the exact same problems. The city is big enough so that it expands, you know, multiple levels of organization just within a city. All these processes that we could recognize as as uh, anatomy and 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 uh, and physiology. And it does retain the basic human values of of um, um and, and so I think if that's true for a city. And for a nation, why wouldn't it be true for the earth? That's that's that's. Uh, I really see continuity there, which I think is a wonderful conclusion to be able to to reach. That the same principles are scale independent. I think is an amazing thing to be able to say. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I think you're right, and and in a way, uh, if we take the the organism analogy. Uh, <clears throat> We we somehow, if we want to live, we have to to keep our our cells happy to give them oxygen and uh, nutrients and everything so that they function. We can't we can't go against their will because it it will destroy 
ourselves too. So indeed, we need to satisfy uh, the, the the functioning of each each level to to get something bigger uh, going. Yeah, I think that's what's on um, on offer. Um, well, I want to end, uh, Clement, on the topic of religion, because Tehard, of course, uh, has this deep spiritual quality to him, and uh, not just spiritual, but something which he regarded as like a metamorphosis of the Christian uh, uh, religion. Uh, he ends the phenomenon of man by saying something to the effect of, even to a mere biologist, this is nothing other than the way of the cross, which uh, is a, a fascinating statement to uh, to uh, make. And a lot of people want to separate the sort of the scientific part of Teilhard with the uh, with the religious and spiritual part. But uh, I'm not sure that that's either possible or or desirable. And and as a way to introduce it, uh, I'd like to observe that there's, as someone who studied religion very carefully, all the way back to my book, Darwin's Cathedral, and published in 2002, that there's actually two major definitions of religion that do not, are not compatible with each other. The first one, of course, defines religion as, as uh, belief in supernatural agency, supernatural agents figures large in one definition of religion. But the second definition was by Durkheim, who wrote, um, a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. Not a word about supernatural agency in that definition. A, a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. So the sacredness of things a moral community is Durkheim's definition of a religion. And I think that that Teilhard's worldview might qualify for that as something which is, in the first place, fully scientific so that we could explain it entirely in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 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 naturalistically, basically. It's a form of methodological uh, naturalism, but nevertheless, if it does function in the way that that you introduce it, in terms of something which provides hope for the future and 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 so on, and 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 identifies something which which we're willing to be a part of, something larger than ourselves, and that we can help to bring it into being, this is a kind of what they call process theology. Uh, it seems to me that that's something that we might want to actually not shy away from and and embrace if we really want this this system to be something that that it does provide a sense of hope and does actually result in the outcome that we're the the benign outcome that we're we're hoping for so what are your thoughts on that and to, uh, to finish up the way Taylor was uh, acting is he was trying actually to to update christianity he, he was trying to make his vision compatible with uh, with Christianity by also by updating or changing the interpretation of um, of what was known or, or believed, uh, and and I think that's what uh, theologians should do is to to keep on uh, reinterpreting the the, the sacred text. Um, with with uh, the with their time, given given what's happening in, in, uh, at this particular time, um, <clears throat> and yeah, the thing is that he did not really succeed um, in, in convincing the church of his uh, ideas and his uh, theological ideas. Or on the contrary, <laughs> 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 uh, but the interesting thing is that. Uh, Yes, he's still very controversial uh, theologically, um, but that that makes him uh, all the more interesting. Um, and so, the, the alternative to that, to to try to to update an existing religion, is to try to to start from 
scratch or, or to start from nature, let's say, and you have uh, this whole movement, which is called religious naturalism, which um, which uh, sees uh, the epic of evolution as something sacred. And so therefore that it's nature that is really uh, the, the sacred. Um, and so I'm not a religious person, so I'm rather attracted to what, to what these views. Uh, but then, and then you have the problem that this kind of attempt, they have no history, basically. So we have no rituals. We have, well, this uh, religious naturalistic um, attempts or others kind of new religions, they don't have their churches, they don't have their rituals. So everything is to be started from scratch. And, and I think it's, it's, it's extremely hard to, to try to justify ritual and, uh, and integrate them in, in the lives of, of people. It, it takes centuries or millennia to, to, to happen. Uh, and, and so in a way, uh, trying to update existing religions or to adapt them is, is um, a very promising strategy too. First of all, this was the, this was the, um, objective of humanism, when you go back to people like uh, Auguste Comte and, and so on, I mean, that was an explicit effort to create a religion of man and, you know, temples, really, and it didn't work. I mean, so so that kind of is in your in your favor. But I think one thing I'd want to end with, when it comes to the pace of cultural evolution, that's highly, highly variable. And we know that the pace of cultural evolution is, has accelerated amazingly. And now, I mean, thanks in part to the internet and the um, and the internet age, clearly cultural change is taking place orders of magnitude faster than it did before. And so, you don't want to lightly say this will take centuries when, in fact, uh, cultural evolution, uh, uh, like chemical change, is something which can be catalyzed and is already. I mean, look at look at how fast it is now. And so. And so um, I do think that um, it is um, possible to have a, a basically a naturalistic religion and, and to be uh, um, uh, not a new idea, but to actually, with some of these new evolutionary concepts, to succeed um, and to give it an experiential component, uh, a ritual component, if you might, to understand the whole nature of ritual just like the whole nature of sacredness is something which need not involve supernatural agency. Uh, so, so these are all what are some of the things that excites me about, about, um, um, updating a uh, Teilhard and the, um, human energy project. And, and, uh, so great to have, uh, uh, great scholars like yourself and, uh, involved. Uh, and so, uh, uh, really happy to have had this conversation with you and, to, and to showcase your work. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure for me too. And I guess we should further discuss this, uh, this possibility of indeed accelerating, uh, uh, religious naturalism. Um, it, it's an excellent point that everything goes faster. So why not, uh, why not this too? Why not this? <laughs>